I mean, some of the interesting characteristics of the checklists that you developed seem to me that they didn't try to be comprehensive and also that they weren't things which people sort of silently, privately went through and ticked, but they were sort of an act of communication and bringing people together. Yeah, the danger is understanding the checklist as a tick box exercise. One of the things that complexity theorists have enumerated is that there's a difference between the simple, the complicated, and the truly complex. The simple is baking a cake out of a box. You can reduce that to a recipe. The complicated is putting a man on the moon. And the truly complex is trying to raise a child. We know raising a child cannot be reduced to a recipe. Even with experience, you can raise one child fabulously and then the next child not well at all. And yet we also know we can recognize a parent who's better than other parents. And in the same way, medicine has the mix of everything from the simple to the complicated to the complex you need to pull off. And when we designed our surgery checklist, we built it around um, trying to bring those principles into the real world. And so we had a series of checks that really were built around how aviation world handles a crashing plane. There are some basic things you want to make sure you don't forget. And in the surgery world, it's make sure antibiotics are given, make sure blood is available for the patient who might be at risk of bleeding. But then the other parts of it are, what are the steps you need as a kind of discipline every time you're doing what you're doing that can help you be prepared for the, the unexpected? And that was, we discovered in the operating rooms, make sure everybody in the room knows each other's mm -hmm. name. Probably the most important component on the checklist, weirdly enough, because you have half a dozen or more people who don't necessarily even know each other that well. But then there are also a few checks like, make sure the surgeon has told the team what the goal of the operation is and how long the case will take, how, how much blood loss they should be prepared for. Make sure the nurse and anesthesiologist have a chance to say what their concerns and questions and plans are. And even allow the porter or the medical student in the room a chance to say, is there any problem that anybody can see here or any question anybody has before we start? And it's really a cultural transformation. It's a set of values built into the idea, with those values being humility and teamwork, both concepts that are, hard, are sometimes hard to come by in medicine. Well, I mean, we, we have this sort of image, perhaps from television and film, of the surgeon as kind of autocratic, a law unto him, himself, and, and sort of brooking no opposition. And an environment in the operating theater where it would be quite difficult for someone who is junior to speak up. And I suppose what the checklist does is enable, gives, gives them a forum in which it's easier to, you know, to, to contribute. Yeah. We, we're at a point where, as a culture, not just in medicine, we're struggling with our image of what it means to be great at what we do in our lines of work. In m much of history, the main struggle we were up against as human beings was ignorance. We just didn't know the answers for what to do. In this 21st century, we've come into a world where there are still great pockets of mystery and ignorance and we don't know what to do about the economy and, and, and so on. But there is also enormous frustration at the incompetence, as we call it, of people to get things right. And a lot of that is out of the belief that we train people to make sure they have it all in their head and then expect them at the moment of critical crisis or just ordinary work to never forget a thing. And it doesn't happen. We believe, we celebrate the cowboy, but what we really want sometimes is the pit crew. Right. And the reality of trying to handle complexity handle the demands of a world where there is tremendous knowledge and science has dumped a ton upon us, um, and also enormous amounts of information we're trying to, to manage. We are having to recognize, almost as a culture, that to be great at what we do is not about being a cowboy. Mm -hmm. It is uh, about having self-discipline and humility. Um, we will never be great at what we do without a checklist. Mm -hmm. So you ran a pilot project in a number of hospitals in a number of parts of the world, and the results were very positive. What, where do we stand now as far as implementation goes? How have your ideas been received in the, in the wider world? Yeah, so at, we, in our eight test hospitals, the average reduction in complications was 36%. This was far beyond what we expected, but it clearly had to do with bringing people to take seriously the idea of trying the discipline of a checklist. 
our eight hospitals volunteered to give this a try. Britain is the first country in the world that jumped right out and, um, and said, we're going to make this the way we do surgery in the country. Uh, the Royal College of Surgeons, the anesthesiologists, people uh, at the most senior levels committed to it. But that doesn't mean at the ground level it's the way it happens. So on the one hand, at the end of this month, all 167 trusts in the NHS are announcing that they have adopted the checklist. But as I visited hospitals in London and actually saw it on the ground, what I saw is people really having gotten it, but it also finding it is incredibly hard. You think it's as simple as running through a checklist. And there are, without question, surgical teams that, um, and surgeons in particular, who will look at this and say, oh God, another piece of paperwork, fine, 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 check, 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 it's done, and miss the point. It is a almost on purpose that we have not made it a series of uh, tick boxes. It's a verbal checklist that they're asked to speak out loud and say, everybody in the room go through, what's your name? And everybody in the room just discuss for 60 seconds the goals, the, the, those kinds of approaches. University College London found that they actually had to pull the teams for a full day and teach them how to talk to each other <laughs> and have a simulation of an operation and coach them and have videotapes. And it seems very elementary, but all of our training in medicine has been about technical ability. Know everything and uh, understand how to execute what you do. But it really ends up being a, a process of transforming the education to recognize there's non-technical ability too. How do a group of people talk to one another, one another in such a way that they can be great at what they do that day, doing five or six operations and making them go as well as possible? And so where we are is the UK um, is actually ahead of the rest of the world. We're at 20% of American hospitals having adopted, and you're at 100%. But you're also coming to the next problem, which is how do you do it well? The aviation world adopted checklists in 1935, and as I describe in the book, right into the 1970s, you had pilots who refused or skipped the checklist because they just didn't think they needed them. And in one really very important crash, killing more than 565 people when two planes crashed into one another, what they realized was that the the checklist at times had descended into a tick box exercise instead of about making sure that before you fly this plane that everybody in the cockpit understands that they are there to make sure no problem has been unaddressed. Mm.